אז כבוד דקן הפקולטה אלי אסיס, כבוד עבודה מארגן את הכנס שרה שוורץ, ששניהם עשו לי אמבוש בספרייה הלאומית ולא יכולתי לסרב כי הרי הקשר שלי עם המחלקה לתנ״ך באוניברסיטת בר אילן התחילה לפני 34 שנים ומי שהיה שם, משה גרסיאל, ספאתי וקליין ועוד כמה אנשים מהדור הפור זוכרים שהיום לא היה היום הראשון ששמעתם על פיופלומטרי זאת אומרת כמה בעצם מה שאמרתי בזמן ההוא על הספר שלי קשר ללא דיבור שבתהילים י"ט פסוק 9 מצוות השם ברא מאירת עיניים הכוונה תאכל מצה ולא צריכים לשים טיפות כי אתה תשמח מאוד מעשיית המצווה. זה מבוסס על הספר של אקארד הס. Oh, I'm sorry, that's okay. The rest of it's going to be in English. Okay, so I was very honored. Uh, it was the second time I was invited here. As a result, Pankower put into the Mikro Gedolot Haketer the Rashi's pictures that had been missing from the Joshua uh, volume. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm very honored to have been asked to chair a session. And I also have to acknowledge that uh, uh, it was only from this department in Israel, Yael Shemesh, and uh, uh, Yitzchak Gottlieb reviewed two of my books, and that was a great honor for me from this uh, department. And uh, with no further ado, this uh, session is called these are the descendants of Jacob. And the first speaker will be Professor Ed Greenstein. Uh, I have to add that he and I studied together at the feet of Moshe Held of Blessed Memory at Columbia University. And Ed has been Professor of Bible at Bar Ilan since 2006, Director of the Institute for Jewish Biblical Interpretation, Prior to that, he was for 10 years at Tel Aviv University, and prior to that, for 20 years at JTS in New York. He also taught at Columbia, Yale, Princeton, and other institutions of higher learning. He has edited the Journal of the Ancient Near Eastern Society since 1974, and has published widely. He has received research fellowships and grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, Institute for Advanced Studies at Hebrew University and Israel Science Foundation. And his presentation today is supported by a current grant from the Israel Science Foundation. And he's completing a commentary on Job for Mikra Yisrael and a commentary on the Book of Lamentations. I found this out, not from him, from the Jewish Publication Society commentary series. We're all looking forward to that. And Ed Greenstein will speak about A Fugitive Aramean Was My Father, the stories of Jacob Israel and the fugitive hero pattern. We have a half hour from now, including questions and comments. Thank you very much, Professor Gruber. And uh, I won't uh, go into any more introductory remarks, uh, but except to say that uh, I'm very pleased you know, that so many people have come uh, from abroad and from here uh, to partake you know, in this uh, feast of uh, sharing and learning. Uh, you'll, it will be very uh, useful to, uh, to, be, to have you, the handout for this lecture at hand. If you receive the kit, you have the handout. And if not, um, you'll have to uh, share with someone. You can still follow without, but it, it helps. And if you have questions about particular details, it might be on the handout. OK. <clears throat> Narratives like sentences have a grammar, a structure. Whether the structure is intrinsic or extrinsic, superimposed by the reader according to accepted conventions, is a question of theoretical orientation, 
Ordinarily, in dealing with biblical narrative, I focus on the strategies of analysis and interpretation that are applied by the reader in seeking to process and make sense of a text. In the present discussion, however, I am interested in laying out a particular narrative pattern that, as I see it, underlies and lies behind the stories of Jacob Israel in the book of Genesis and in demonstrating where this fundamental pattern is elaborated in the text. I also hope to show that the presence of this particular narrative pattern in the Jacob Israel stories poses a challenge to typical accounts of the formation of the text in biblical studies, especially in classical documentary and neo-documentarian perspectives. The Jacob Israel narrative in Genesis is a perfect exemplar of a widespread ancient Near Eastern story pattern I call the fugitive hero. In this story, a protagonist is compelled to leave his homeland and then, with divine support, to return to a position of leadership and or high standing following a period of self-imposed or externally imposed exile. Instances of this narrative pattern from outside Israel in the ancient Near East are the story of Sinue from Egypt, early second millennium, the story of Idrimi, king of Alalach from north Syria, 15th century, the story of Hattushili III, king of Hatti, 13th century, the story of Asarchadon, king of Assyria, 7th century, and the story of Nabonidus, king of Babylon, 6th century. In the Hebrew Bible, the pattern is found in nearly all the major narratives, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, and the formation of the people of Israel. The pattern is represented in part in such stories as those of Hagar, Gideon, Jephthah, Jeroboam, Hadad the Edomite in 1 Kings 11, and Joash, or Jehoash. Scholars have observed similarities among some of these stories for decades. In 1987, Robin King published a study of the Joseph story in which most of the major texts were brought to bear. But because he had tied his analysis to the scheme of the Russian fairy tale developed in the early 20th century by the folklorist Vladimir Prop, he failed to describe the fugitive hero pattern in all its elements. An examination of all the stories reveals a very specific pattern comprising up to 14 features, and it's on the handout. But I'm going to read it anyway. One, the hero is a younger or youngest brother. Two, there occurs a political and or personal crisis. Three, the hero flees or is exiled. Four, the hero enjoys the support of a female patron, sometimes a goddess. Five, the hero marries the daughter of his host in exile. Six, the hero assumes a position of responsibility in the host's household. Seven, the hero has a divine encounter, often divination or revelation. Eight, the hero is joined by kin. Nine, there is a seven-year period, usually of exile. Ten, the hero repels an attack or attacks. Eleven, the hero takes spoil or plunders. Twelve, the hero returns home. 13, the hero is restored to a position of leadership and or honor. 14, the hero establishes or renews a cult, often appointing an immediate relative as priest. Every one of these narrative elements is found in the, within the Jacob story. But in most instances, certain optional features are absent, such as the marriage of the hero to the daughter of his foreign host. The marriage of the hero is found in the Egyptian tale of Sinue and in the stories of Jacob and Moses, it is slightly transformed in the Hittite story of Hattushili III, as it is more than once in the biblical story of David. But it is altogether missing from the story of Idrimi from North Syria, even though all the other narrative features are represented there. We are dealing with a relatively fixed narrative type. Variations from the common pattern can be interpreted as meaningful in relation to the literary context in which a given story is found. The fugitive hero pattern is, so far as I can tell, peculiar to the ancient Near East and particularly prominent in the Bible, whereas only one example of the pattern has been found, respectively, in Egypt, Asia Minor, Syria, Assyria, and Babylonia. The Bible almost, in the Bible, almost all the extensive hero-centered narratives manifest the pattern. To some degree, it may be suggested that the fugitive hero pattern is the DNA of biblical narrative. This claim rests on a certain homology, right, same pattern, between the story of Israel's development as a people and the stories of Jacob and other biblical heroes, and not necessarily, necessarily Israelite ones. 
Israel is a younger nation that is forced to go into Egyptian exile where it mixes in with the native population, think of the Erev Rav, is taken out with divine support, repels attacks by Egypt and Amalek along the way, and returns to the land of Canaan where it establishes its dominion and the cult of its national god. It is possible and perhaps even likely that so many biblical narratives were shaped according to the contours of the fugitive hero pattern by virtue of the fact that it is that pattern that shapes the national narrative. Israel's story is that of the fugitive hero. The nexus between the individual hero and the national narrative comes to expression in the credo recited by the Israelite farmer bringing his first fruits to the local sanctuaries on the second page of the handout. He begins his digest of national history by referring to his ancestor, a fugitive Aramean who sojourned in Egypt where he sired an entire people who were oppressed in exile before being returned to their homeland, Deuteronomy 26.5. That the ancestor in question is Jacob, the eponymous forefather of Israel, who spent 20 years in Aram is clear. And that the Hebrew verb avad has the archaic sense of taking flight, cognate to Akkadian abatu, which in the end conjugation is the regular verb for fleeing, has long been recognized. Jacob, as a parade example of the fugitive hero, flees both to and from his exile from Canaan in Aram. Genesis 27, 43, 31, 20 to 22, and 27. This is the very tradition about Jacob that is invoked in Hosea 12, 13. Please see the handout. The Israelites, of course, flee from Egypt, Exodus 14, 5. The past century has witnessed a number of efforts to approach a fairly universal description of hero stories. But none of these has produced a scheme that is, as both, uh, that is both as specific and as snug a fit as the fugitive hero pattern. Christopher Booker, in his magisterial study, The Seven Basic Plots, reaches the highest level of abstraction by reconstructing a single overarching story of a child leaving the maternal haven and making its way into the world narrowly escaping peril and finding its way back to the safety of the home. Only in the broadest terms does the ancient Near Eastern fugitive hero pattern resemble Booker's universal plot. A more pertinent analysis is provided by Harry Slokauer in his 1970 book Mythopoesis, who builds his model principally on classical literature. The hero departs from a harmonious society and, being something of a rebel, embarks on a quest in the course of which he poses a challenge to that society. His reintegration upon coming home produces a new harmony, but the residue of conflict is tragically never resolved, never dissolved. Slokauer does not apply his scheme to any of the ancient Near Eastern or biblical figures whom I would classify as fugitive or exiled heroes, although H.H. H. Schlossman finds an example in Joseph. Ronald Hendel, who is with us today, has delineated a 10-part characterization of the Jacob story by drawing comparisons with the narratives about the early life of Moses. There are several points in common with the fugitive hero pattern, especially in regard to the hero's marriage to his host's daughter. However, the details of these comparisons, like the meeting at the well, are not shared by the, ma by the many other stories comporting with the fugitive hero pattern. The focus is on the early life of the hero, whereas the fugitive hero pattern takes the protagonist back to his people, where he demonstrates military prowess and establishes or reestablishes a cult. The analysis of the Jacob Israel stories that most resembles the fugitive hero analysis is that of Albert de Puri, beginning in his large 1975 work on divine promise and ritual cult in the so-called Jacob cycle, and in subsequent studies. Like Handel, de Puri focuses on the center of the narrative in which the hero takes refuge in a foreign place, marries the daughter of the local leader, produces a clan of his own, amasses wealth, and returns home with his head held high. De Puri compares a Bedouin tale that has a similar plot to the Jacob story. The hero goes into exile after committing a crime. When he departs, he is given a promise ensuring his ultimate return. Once abroad, he is recruited for service in a local tribe. Years later, he returns to his own tribe, rich and powerful. The pattern outlined by de Puri suits the Moses story no less than the Jacob narrative. However, the emphasis is on the, Jacob, on the cycle of return 
within a family saga. The fugitive hero pattern, on the other hand, has a much stronger political and military dimension, as well as a major component of a cultic character. In most instances, the hero is supported and advised by a deity, and the story is consummated with the establishment or renewal of a cult dedicated to the support of God or goddess. The fugitive hero pattern is more extensive, and in the case of Jacob, it incorporates more elements of the narrative. Jacob's story, when viewed against the outline of the fugitive hero pattern, begins not with his deception of his father and brother, but at the beginning, when his status as the younger of two brothers is clarified. His acts of exploitation and deception of Esau lead to his brother's hatred of him and his, to his need to flee. In that move, he is directed by his female protector, his mother Rebekah. After arriving in Haran, he marries his host and uncle's daughter, or daughters, re working a seven-year period for each. He is given charge over many herds of small cattle in Laban's household, but after nearly three periods of seven years' service, he is ordered by his god, Adonai, Yudhe to leave and return to his homeland. On the way home, Jacob must repel two attacks, one from a divine being whom the classical sages perspicaciously identified as Esau's guardian spirit, and one from Esau himself. Of course, in the end, there was no combat between Jacob and Esau, but that would seem to have something to do with Jacob's fending off the guardian spirit on the one hand, and with his buying his brother's favor with a series of gifts on the other. The point that should not be forgotten is that Jacob made ready for possible warfare. Returning to Canaan from Haran, Jacob took with him hordes of wealth, mostly in the form of herds, representing his outsmarting Laban, again with divine assistance. Upon his return to Canaan, Jacob is established as a major power in the land. This may, seem, may be seen in his clan's besting of the men of Shechem, or it may only be discerned in the divine assurance of 35, 9 through 12, which I quote in English. God was seen by Yaakov again, when he came back from the country of Aram, and he gave him blessing. God said to him, Yaakov is your name. Yaakov shall, be your, shall your name be called no more, for your name shall be Yisrael. And he called his name Yisrael. God said further to him, I am God Shaddai, bear fruit and be many. Nation, yes, a host of nations shall come from you. The land that I gave to Abraham and to Yitzchak, to you I give it, and to your seed after you I give the land. Everett Fox's translation. Last but not least, from the perspective of the fugitive hero paradigm, Jacob Israel constructs altars at Shechem and Beit El, Bethel, initiating the Israelite cults at these locations. The fugitive hero, as a successful younger son and underdog, exudes divine favor. His journey is one in which the support of God is cultivated and brought to fulfillment. The dedication of cult sites and or rituals to the helping deity is a crucial element, if not the very raison d'etre, of the narrative. Literary historians, otherwise known as higher critics, of the Jacob narratives tend to neglect the trajectory of the story, choosing to regard the text in two different and sometimes complementary ways. On the one hand, they tend to see the Jacob story composed of a series of smaller narrative sequences embedded one within the other. Please see the handout, uh, page two at the bottom, for an example. It's a kind of combination of two. On the one hand, they tend to see the Jacob's, oh, I said that already, uh, smaller narrative sequences embedded one within the other. Combining the schemes of Zev Weissman and Klaus Westermann, which largely overlap, for example, we find the conflict between Leah and Rachel in the middle, set within the conflict between Laban and Jacob, which is, which is set in turn within the conflict between Jacob and Esau. The biographical framework of Jacob's life from birth to death frames the embedded sequences. David M. Carr adopts a similar approach. For him, the story of Jacob and Esau frames the narrative. In the next inside ring are Jacob's encounters with God. In the next inside ring are Jacob's relations with his wives. And in the middle are the mirror tales of the family's growth and of the amazing proliferation of Jacob's herds. It is hard to see the linear development of the fugitive hero plot when one is fixated on concentric structures, box within box. A second 
characteristic of the literary historical analysis of the Jacob Israel stories is to separate episode from episode by assigning them to different literary sources or layers. This is a necessary move from the perspective of the fugitive hero pattern when one encounters duplications of plot elements, one of which seems to suit the pattern and one of which does not. An obvious example concerns the motivation of the hero's flight. I've given you the texts on page two of the handout. In the version usually attributed to Jay or to the non-priestly material, Jacob flees to Syria in order to escape the jealous hatred of his brother. In the priestly version, Jacob is sent to Rebekah's family in Padanaram in order to marry a non-Canaanite woman, ideally a member of the ancestral clan. Such a journey does not ensue from a life-threatening crisis. It is not a flight, and therefore does not conform very well to the fugitive hero pattern. Conventional and neo-documentarian theorists break up the fugitive hero pattern by ascribing some elements to J, some to E, and some to P, even if they do not agree among themselves about which is which. For example, in his 2003 volume, The Bible with Sources Revealed, Richard Elliott Friedman assigns most of the first half or more, or more of the fugitive hero features of the Jacob Israel stories to J, and most of the second half to E. It should be clear by now that, in my view, the overall outline of the plot, minus some lengthy elaborations that are not necessary to the pattern, such as the theophany at Beit El and the marvelous multiplication of the animals, is a whole that should not be divided. There are essentially two ways of explaining the correspondence of the Jacob Israel narrative with the fugitive hero pattern. The pattern could have been superimposed on the materials in the later stages of composition and redaction. Once disparate materials could have been combined and elaborated in order to accommodate the traditional narrative paradigm. While I regard this as possible, I think it is an, un an extremely unlikely scenario. First, let us recall that the Jacob Israel story is the most complete of all the exemplars of the pattern. Second, the later instances of the pattern outside Israel, in the first millennium in Assyria and Babylonia, are weaker versions of the pattern than earlier ones from the second millennium. If you look at the bottom of page one in the, uh, the, the partial uh, scheme that I've given you there, the chart. Accordingly, I prefer to explain the form of the Jacob Israel story as being shaped from the outset according to the fugitive hero structure. In a general way, this is how classical higher critics like Otto Eisfeld account for the combination of sources. They were shaped according to an early traditional narrative that precedes the formation of the literary versions we call J, E, P, etc. It lies in the background. I do not claim to know as much as many source and redaction critics about the processes by which the present text of Genesis was composed. I imagine it to have been a very complicated process taking place in stages over time. However, I do believe that before the prose narratives that we know came into being, there were traditional stories constructed on traditional patterns. There is no ancient Near Eastern and Hebrew story pattern as extensive and specific as that of the fugitive hero paradigm. And it seems quite clear to me that the Jacob Israel story, from the time it was first told, was conceived and related in the widespread and inherited pattern of the fugitive hero. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a lot of time left for questions. Uh, and thank you. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, I want uh, just two uh, small remarks. First of all, I still think the pattern you uh, discovered in the Jacob Tales um, is uh, compatible with a little pop pattern. It, it is. It, it fits in. I'm sorry, the, which pattern? It, it's the 31 element pattern. Oh. Oh. It fits oh. in. Okay. Um, the second remark, you will be very interested, I think, in the book by Jim Foley on the returning hero, because he has it in the Beowulf tale, the Odyssea, and in Balkan narratives. Yeah, I'm aware of it. I, uh, but there, I have to say that uh, my reinspection after people, I presented something like this uh, a year ago, 
Um, and uh, people said, you really need to look again at the Homeric epics. I looked again. It does not seem but, to but suit you, the pattern. You, you need spe specifically the analysis of Jim Foley. OK, thank you. <laughs> Since we have uh, Idri, me, Lisa Haddon, and Nabonidus, we think actually existed. Yes. So are you attributing this pattern to essentially the traditional template for how to tell a story, which would then have filled in things that may not have actually happened with Lisa Haddon and Nabonidus? I mean, does the pattern generate episodes <coughs> even with historical figures? Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to answer it briefly, as, as you can imagine. Okay, um, when, when historians write, we know from Hayden White, and you wouldn't, we would know without Hayden White. We, we, we would know without Hayden White. Right, that when we, that when we tell stories or write history, uh, we, we don't simply report all the facts, which would be as interesting as reading the telephone book. Uh, but we, we shape a narrative out of a selection of facts. Right, we use a you know, preset uh, paradigms, and that's how I see uh, these texts. I see even the, the, the stories of Nabonidus and Esarhaddon. Although one has to admit, you know, that we know some things about you know those historical figures, but much of what we know concerning the events that are are are, are told in the specific narratives I am referring to, we only know from these particular texts. Uh, you know, an excellent example is. Uh, you know, is the story of Idrimi, which uh, some of you know is, you know, for me where it all started. Um, and then it started, and then before it was published, uh, it was, we were helped a lot by Murray Lichtenstein, who said, you better look at Sinewe as well. Um, in any case, um, in Idrimi, we, we, we know that there was an Idrimi. There, there are a couple documents about him, but we wouldn't know anything about any of the details in the story were not, you know, for his inscription. Now, I'm assuming that some things in the, in the inscription in his story are what we would call fact and some are what we might call fiction. And I, I assume it's the same for the, the traditional stories. Now, in the case of Jacob, um, if you're trying to pin me down, to, you know, as to whether there was actually a historical Jacob, okay, you're not trying to do it. But I would say that, that, that Israel's ancestor stories were, were strongly shaped that way. And the fact that David's story has that pattern, although it's so complex, you know, that the, the pattern is almost buried there. If, you don't, if you're not looking for the pattern, you, might not, you could easily not find it. The story of Jeroboam has a good deal of the pattern, but not the complete pattern. And, and these are, you know, among the earliest uh, historical narratives, uh, you know, according to most scholars, historical narratives of Israel. And so uh, I see this as, I think I've answered your question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one observation that I just want to share in light of Ed's uh, very illuminating comments and then a question for Ed. Uh, what, what Ed showed us is that when we're looking at hypotheses about the formation of the final text that we have before us, Ed has shown us a way of developing a control, that if there's a certain pattern that we see in our text that seems to mirror a well-known and established pattern elsewhere, then that makes it more difficult to claim that there are two parts that all just coincidentally, when you put them together, make this pattern. And that same claim is sometimes made with regard to uh, an analysis of uh, the flood narrative, that when you take the uh, so-called key and non-key versions apart, then they don't resemble anything that we have in the ancient Near East. But when you hold them together, then they become surprisingly close in the total picture that comes out to what we know about uh, uh, the, flood, the, flood, the flood story from uh, Ashra Hasis. So that's, uh, that's just the same type of methodology uh, that, that it shows us here. And I was wondering, since, since you mentioned that uh, the, the most established or most elaborate uh, exemplar of the uh, uh, of the, uh, the pattern is in, in Jacob, and that this happens to reflect more of the earlier materials, Sinaue and, and Idrimi. What, what, what are the implications of that for, for dating? Oh. Um, I don't, I'm not going to claim that there are any implications for dating, because uh, the pattern was clearly known you know, down to the 6th century uh, BCE. Um, yeah, but if, if, if if it's much weaker there. It's, it's well, okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, this, okay, this, again, I'm going to have to answer you briefly 
and I'm going to give you the full answer you, you want, okay? But briefly, uh, I, I, I believe that there, that, that there were many, many more stories you know, of the fugitive hero type in the ancient Greece. It was just one of the stories. In the same way that, you know, it's like people say you've seen one, you know, Western movie, you know, Western, you've seen one Western, you've seen them all. I don't think if you've seen one Western, you've seen them all. But if you've seen the right four, you have seen them all. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, seriously, uh, uh, Irving Berlin, uh, I'm sorry for the students who might have heard me uh, tell this story uh, before, you know, but, but I think it's a great example. Irving Berlin, who was you know, a great American songwriter, maybe the greatest of the mid-20th century, uh, Irving Berlin was once interviewed you know, about where he comes up with all these melodies. And he said, there are really only are six melodies. And I've used them all many times. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm not saying you know, that with the specificity of this pattern that, uh, you know, that there's, you know, there are lots of different versions, but I think that this pattern doesn't have to be used in full. But I think that the pattern was probably used many more times that, that we know about in what I, what I imagine was the oral prehistory of the literature that we know in the Hebrew Bible. You know, so that I don't, the only way that I personally you know, would feel comfortable about dating would be either um, through uh, geographical, you know, topographical, possible historical allusions, although I'm not sure there are really any in the Jacob story. Some people think there are. There's a brand new article in Tel Aviv the uh, journal Tel Aviv uh, by uh, Nadav Nehman, uh, who argues for uh, relatively late dating of the Jacob materials. I don't accept his arguments. I have many criticisms of it, but it's serious. Uh, it's a serious work to consider. I'm very influenced by Baruch Halpern and others who point to, and uh, Zev Weissman, while we're here in Israel, Zev Weissman, who point to various uh, toponyms in the Jacob stories and in the David stories that really have no significance in the history of Israel after the time of David, or after the time of Jeroboam, let's say. And so to me, that, that, that speaks volumes. Um, that's all I can say. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, I'm guessing you anticipated this question, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway. Don't give me too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> you said several times that um, the Jacob Israel story is the most complete um, example of the fugitive, fugitive hero pattern. Could we, but, but if we take away an element or two, or maybe even more, it still follows the pattern, just it's not as complete as the, as the other examples from right. the Jamiri's show. That's right. How would you react to a suggestion that would say that, separating the presumed sources, that the non-priestly material in the Pentateuch perhaps follows the fugitive hero pattern, although it's incomplete, as are some other uh, stories from the ancient Near East, whereas the priestly story does not follow that pattern, but, but follows a different pattern. Would this conform with your reading of the text? Uh, no, because the, uh, uh, the pattern, to me, is a trajectory. And uh, when you look at the, the, tip, the, at least the conventional source critical analyses, uh, the one source tends to pile up in the first end, and another source or another tradition in the second end. And to me, uh, there are certain elements that are basically, uh, you know, that, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are almost ubiquitous, you know, that are not, you know, obligatory for the pattern. You know, the, the flight, for example, or the being caused to flee. Um, I think that the return home and the establishment of some kind of cult or, or, or re-establishment of cult is also very important. And I don't think it can be left just to the priestly uh, you know, literature. I think that this would be part of, the, um, of, of whatever story might lie behind the present text. Thank you.